this uh, is a really nice follow up after Lorene's <clears throat> presentation, because I'm going to be talking about an entirely different kind of habitat. And mountain goats uh, have been proposed for, for introduction. Uh, it was planned for last October. Fortunately, a number of conservation groups came together and started talking about what would happen if mountain goats were introduced. The plan was to bring part of the population from the Tusher Mountains because there are so many down there. So why not bring them to Logan? Lorene addressed very well, mountain goats are not native. That's a big issue. Um, Division of Wildlife Resources will say, well, they're in Utah. We're just um, augmenting their range. The proposed location that was proposed for last October was uh, Logan Peak. I understand now that uh, Naomi Peak is another proposed spot for introduction. You know what my bias is, what's wrong with mountain goats in Northern Utah. <laughs> they prefer alpine habitats. And uh, what Lorraine was showing in the Tushers is entirely different than what we have in Logan. We have no alpine habitat. So where would mountain goats go? <laughs> they would go on the cliff faces, which is where our endemic plants in Logan Canyon grow. The reasons for introduction that uh, Division of Wildlife Resources has given is enjoyment of residents and hunting. Obviously, uh, it would bring a very specialized kind of hunter. <clears throat> and also uh, management of overpopulation and other herds, specifically the Tusher Mountains, and I think some would come from the LaSalle's. So it's getting rid of an overpopulation, which has been a huge problem in the Tetons. There was hunting last summer by, from, uh, with wildlife people coming in with helicopter trying to control the overpopulation of mountain goats. And more to the point of this conference and, and um, my talk is that Logan Canyon has one of the highest concentrations of rare plants in Utah within a narrow canyon area. So what's so special about Logan Canyon? Oh, first a little bit about the mountain goats. <laughs> They're not true goats. Um, they are part of the bovidae. They're more closely related to cattle than they are to goats. They're agile, methodical climbers. I'm going to show you a number of pictures of mountain goats doing different things. They can leap as far as, as 12 feet. Uh, they climb on cliffs. They love cliff faces. They, they will definitely, if they come into Logan Canyon, they will definitely be on cliff faces. They eat not only herbaceous things, but they'll browse on alpine firs and conifers. Logan Canyon is uh, designated as a scenic byway in Utah. Uh, most of you have been in Logan, uh, been up the canyon, and know that there are summer homes that are on Forest Service land uh, up and down the canyon. And the points that I'm showing you on this screen, do you see my cursor? That's showing you where the proposed introductions are, Millville Peak and Logan Peak. Uh, but again, there's now talk of bringing it to Mount Naomi, which is uh, not quite 10,000 feet high. Logan Peak also is below 10,000 feet. Those are the highest points in Logan Canyon. There is, again, no alpine habitat, which is preferred habitat for mountain goats. You could look at this from a standpoint of, of animal health. Are we abusing animals by bringing mountain goats to this habitat? <laughs> uh, mountains are young. The Wasatch Mountains in Utah are still in a very uh, active orogenic period. What's different about the Bear River Range in Utah, which distinguishes it from areas to the south, is there, there, um, 
there yeah i'm trying to think whole lots of things we've got dolomitic limestones in logan canyon uh, above salt lake city you've got quartzites there are many questions about why we have so many endemics in the canyon but largely it's it's habitat it's just south of the south end of glaciers there's no continental glacier coming into this area the southern extent of continental glaciers is in western wyoming we have a mountain glacier near tony grove lake and a glacial cirque uh, the rare the rarest of our rare plants is apparently a glacial refugium the only federally listed rare plant we have is Primula maguirii, but there are 12 others that are on the Utah watch list, most of which have been considered uh, safe from disturbance or predation because they are so inaccessible. We have always said, because these are on cliff faces, you couldn't even do a transect. You can't do population study because of the inaccessibility of the site. And I go through the rare plants that occur here, you'll see how difficult it would be to even figure out what the mountain goats would be eating if they are there. A great reason not to introduce them is who wants to go through the fecal material to see what they're eating. Okay, uh, native range for mountain goats is, um, Idaho North, the, but the introductions that have happened in Wyoming, in Utah, Colorado, Nevada have had a, a great impact. There is no evidence that mountain goats were in Utah even during the Pleistocene. So these are all introductions that have happened in the last few decades. In Utah, we've got them in the Uinta Mountains, in the Tushers, in the Banti LaSalle and the LaSalle Mountains. Um, I believe there are some on Willard Peak and that's being used as a, as a reason to say, well, they're already in the Wasatch Cache Forest. Let's just bring some more of these individuals in from the South. In the LaSalle Mountains, uh, thanks uh, Mark Coles Ritchie for your wonderful report working with Mary O'Brien on the impacts of mountain goats in, in the LaSalles. Again, this, this is alpine habitat that we do not have in, in Logan. So where are the goats going to be grazing? <laughs> Without the alpine habitat, they're going to be on these cliff faces. This is um, one of the largest populations of Primula maguirii that we know from Logan Canyon on the cliff faces. On Lake Town Dolomites, again, other areas in Utah do not have this dolomite exposed. Easy access for goats but completely uh, well protected from over collecting by people because it is not accessible. Other species that grow with the Maguire primrose are Mucinion linearii, the narrow-leaved parsley, and uh, Draba maguirii, a mustard. For years, we thought a thing that was on Mount Naomi was um, just a white flowered variant of Mucinion linearii, but it became more and more obvious to me through the years that this was something different. And in the 1980s, I sent specimens to specialists who were working with Mucinion, but most people said, well, we don't know much about Mucinion. It's not even a, um, a, a genus that we know much about. And lacking anyone else describing it, <laughs> Frank Smith and I went ahead and described this as the Mount Naomi parsley just in 2018. 
Another species in Logan Canyon that had been overlooked uh, is quite rare, uh, really hadn't been seen by many people, was a violet that Frank Smith started looking at closely in the early 1990s. He brought a specimen into me and said, I think this is something different. And at the time I said, you know, Noel Holmgren's working on violets for the Intermountain Flora. Would you show it to him? And uh, Noel recognized it as a distinctive species and named it Viola Frank Smithii, commonly called Buddy's Violet. We, we affectionately refer to Frank as Buddy. This is in a very remote area, but it has been impacted by climbers. The Forest Service has been involved in putting up information signs to try to keep uh, climbers off this particular climbing wall, which as far as we know is the largest population. Penstemon compactus is another species that's endemic to Logan Canyon. And we have uh, been finding different sites for it. I, I camped on, went up to Logan this is a photograph that I took of Penstemon compactus there. And related to what Lorene was saying about the Castilea being, uh, being grazed more than some other species, now I'm getting an unstable remote connection sign. Can you still hear me? We're, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's palatable. Things in, in this family related to the Castileas, the Penstemons, the Pacara that was not being grazed would be a poisonous plant. And I think that might be some of why the goats were avoiding it. Cronquist daisy, uh, again, a lot of our plants in Logan Canyon are named for the botanists that are so well known. Uh, some of you may not know that Arthur Cronquist was a student at Utah State University along with Arthur Holmgren, who took botany from Bassett McGuire, for whom the McGuire primrose is named. So here's, here's the Cronquist daisy. Uh, Arthur Cronquist did a monograph of Ariagna, of Erigeron, sorry, for his, uh, for his PhD. And this is Erigeron Cronquistii growing near Tony Grove Lake. Orthocarpus holmgreniorum is another species that had been overlooked. It was classified as a variety of Orthocarpus tolmii, which is yellow flowered and quite distinctive. So when Frank and I described the Mucinion naomiensis, we in that same publication elevated Orthocarpus uh, variety holmgreniorum to species status. It's, it's quite distinctive. Uh, pink flowered at the type locality, which is on the road to Tony Grove Lake, this population is heavily impacted both by cattle grazing, yeah, multiple use, and by the droughts that we've been experiencing. Last summer in an area where at one time there had been many plants, hundreds of plants, I could only find five. So big, big concerns about what's happening in Logan Canyon. Thanks to Dave Wallace and the hiking club and to Mindy Wheeler and the botany crew, more popul we know there are quite a few more populations, but definitely at the Southern lowest elevation range for this species, it is, it, it's in trouble at, at a lot of sites. The work that uh, Mindy is has been doing, I, I had the good fortune to go out with her in the field last summer. And in at the left, she's looking at the cliffs that we were surveying. Um, I used to go up on some of those cliff faces. I don't do that anymore. So again, these are remote areas that are really, it, it would be impossible to do a transect to even know what the impact is on a lot of these species. So this is just an example of the mapping that's being done by Mindy and her botany crew for element occurrences as well as uh, predicted habitats. And on these maps, uh, she's showing where the proposed mountain goat 
habitat is. Very valuable having these maps. A couple of the endemics are things that might be more widespread than we have known in the past because they're so easy to overlook. The Wasatch rock cress, for instance, uh, Bulcura lasia carpa is showy in flower, but then uh, on the right, you can see that it would be, it would be hard to find later in the season. Also probably quite palatable to the mountain goats. So we've got uh, Buckera lasia carpa on the left and on the right, we've got the Western bladder pod, Physaria macrocarpa, which is um, endemic to the Wasatch range. And it's in this, <laughs> I'm going to point to it. It's tucked in right there, uh, a place I, I sat down to have lunch last summer and it's like, yeah, it's in there, <laughs> but it's hard, hard to see, easily overlooked. So thanks to the conservation groups come in to, to, to respond to the proposed introduction of mountain goats. Audubon Society has been very active. Nature Conservancy has, has chimed in. Utah Na Native Plant Society is immensely important in all of this. And we know from past history that claiming that you can't put an introduced species, you shouldn't put an introduced species on federal lands that didn't work to prohibit mountain goat introduction in the LaSalle's or the Tushers. The Wild Utah Project people have, been, have helped out and, and a representative, some representatives from the Yellowstone to Uintas connection. Decisions will be made by the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources um, and the USDA Forest Service should have input. I, th I think it's much more in the hands of, of the state though. Just to wrap up this talk, Utah, as, as we know, is an amazing place for endemic plants. One of the highest concentrations in, in North America. We have 2,600 species of vascular plants, 10% are endemic to the state and most are very rare. We're still finding new species. The work in Logan Canyon is a good example of that with uh, two species recently described. Um, and we have lots of unique habitats in the state, but most of our rare species are in the desert areas. Northern Wasatch is a real hot spot of rarity. And through the years, you've heard me, some of you have heard me talk quite a bit about what's happening in Logan Canyon. So thanks to everyone involved. Um, when you're working in the field and you think you might have a new record, please know that you can go to any of these good herbaria in the state and get help. We hope you're making voucher specimens or taking good photographs. If you find that it's indeed a new record, please, um, you can work through the herbarium with permitting through, through the Forest Service or wherever it occurs and get those records. Check existing records. Um, the Intermountain Biota Database is a great place to go. I know I can't do a live link here, but this will be, um, this will be available on the Utah Native Plant Society website and search Intermountain Herbarium. Herbarium. This is a collaborative effort so collections uh, from herbaria around the state are in, you can get to through this portal. If you think you've got a new record, you need to, to make a specimen. This is an incredible resource. You can go into the, the database and if specimens have been digitized, you'll even see images of them, details of collection records, so this is just how it looks when you go into that portal. Uh, in, in Logan, uh, Utah State, the herbarium is still in a basement. Uh, someday perhaps it will be in a natural history museum, but 
there's been recent remodeling and uh, clear signage to get you there. It's, it's really wonderful space. And Chris Vias, who is the new collections manager, can help you get you oriented and working with the database. So that's a plug for the Intermountain Herbarium. And again, the endemic plants that we have, which plants grow in mountain goat habitat, they all do. And that's the end of my talk. <laughs>